If there's one thing that I could say I love more than anything when it comes to horror games, I would most definitely say that it was character design. More specifically, character design with symbolism. And when I tell you that after playing through In Sound Mind for the first time, I was in love with the design of this game and its little symbolisms, that is not an understatement in the slightest. This game is filled to the brim with symbolism, all the way down to little details like insignificant notes that the player may not even bother to pick up. And even just taking the point away from that aspect, this game has an amazing atmosphere and an even more incredible soundtrack to accompany it. Which, by the way, the soundtrack for this game was developed by none other than the Living Tombstone themselves, so you already know what level of quality we're working with here. And I also want to note that they absolutely do not disappoint. This game has an absolutely amazing soundtrack. But I say this all to make the point that I absolutely love this game, and in this video, I just want to go through some of the character designs of each of the game's main characters. Because for a psychological horror game, it definitely does not skip out on the psychological part. Which makes a little bit more sense if I give you a little overview of the game. In the game In Sound Mind, you play as Desmond Wales, a psychologist who has recently been losing his patience due to an unknown reason. Which is seemly and completely out of the blue and extremely suspicious to Desmond. Starting the game, we find ourselves in this sort of dream reality that represents the outside world. An apartment building with a strange flood going on outside which only worsens as the game progresses. For each of Desmond's patients, Virginia Rule, Alan Shore, Max Nygaard, and Lucas Cole, we enter an area that represents them, their struggles, and the last place that they were seen in before they died. As well as this, we must confront their spirits and help them let go of their struggles, all the while trying to figure out what is causing their unusual deaths. Also, if you don't want any spoilers, just skip this section. I'll give you a couple of seconds to skip to the timestamp that's on screen. It turns out that the whole time it'd been caused by this chemical known as Agent Rainbow, a fear-based experiment chemical which was planned to be used as chemical warfare by the US government. And it had been the cause for each and every single one of Desmond's patients' deaths in one way or another. This chemical is also the main antagonist of the game and will terrorize Desmond throughout the entire game as a hallucination. However, you do not know this until the end of the game. And with each and every single one of these characters, we find incredible symbolism for them and their struggles, and that's what I want to talk about today. From their level design to just themselves and everything is so meticulously thought out and matches the patience it's made for. Starting off with Desmond's first patient, Virginia Rule. I want to take a quick moment to note down a few things that we'll be seeing present with each design. The first of which being that each patient is represented by either a Greek mythology creature or a story. And for Virginia, we find her to represent the story of Medusa, which for those who don't know, Medusa was a woman with snakes for hair who would turn anyone who looked into her eyes into stone. More specifically, she was a gorgon, which had a lot of different interpretations, but is described specifically as having snakes for hair in any kind of thing that I can find for it. But how does that relate to Virginia and her disorder? Well, when Virginia was younger, she was the daughter of a pageant mom, and from a very young age was entered into a lot of beauty pageants, and was constantly criticised by her mother for her performances and looks. And eventually it all comes to a head when one day a mirror in the bathroom falls on Virginia while she was messing around with her mother's makeup. This leaves her with permanent scarring on her face and makes her become unable to continue on in the pageants, and also causes her to develop an extreme social anxiety disorder surrounding her face and just specifically anyone looking at her face and being scared that she'll be judged for it. Before starting her segment, we are able to enter her apartment much like the other patients we will encounter. The apartment is dark and covered in police tape and broken glass from the shattered mirrors found throughout it. We were also able to find some notes, namely a poem written by Virginia herself, a letter from her mother asking why she'd stop picking up the phone and that she needs to do something other than selling toys as it isn't earning her enough money, a medical bill for her face stitches, and finally an ink blot test, also known as a Rorschach test, from Desmond which reads, We spoke of running a Rorschach test, have you done one before? No, but I've seen it in movies, you show me a picture and I say what it makes me feel? I'll show you an ink block and you tell me what it might look like. Shall we do a few? Sure. The flower, but it's broken. A crowded auditorium. 
Two people fighting. What might this be? The monster with six arms, like snakes? I'm sorry, I just sound incredibly stupid. Not at all, there are no wrong answers, Virginia. How does this last inkblot make you feel? Powerful. And on top of all of this, and most importantly, we have a notice from the local store Eden's Grove, which tells us about its closure. This causes everything to go wrong for Virginia, and she tells Desmond during one of her meetings that this local shop that she'd always went to had been closed down due to a lack of visitors, after a new larger chain shop called Homemart takes all of the attention. We learn this during the short section that we get at the start of Virginia's tape, which with each patient we get our own start of the tape, which gives us a few recordings from their meetings with Desmond. And Virginia's go as follows. It's just sad, you know? It's not fair. I've been getting food and stuff from Eden's Grove for like my whole life. They expect me to just be okay with them ruining this town and forcing me to shop at their place? This makes me really sad. Am I crazy? I am crazy, right? No. Changes like these can be uncomfortable. The Eden's Grove was certainly a staple of the community. I can't get my food at Poma Mart. I won't. Well, what other options do we have? Uh, perhaps outside of Milton Haven? No, that's even further outside where I feel safe. I understand. And believe that there's an opportunity here to work on our exercises in small and timely steps. I can see you're getting nervous. That's okay. I know. I... I'm sorry. I just... What if it overwhelms me? We focus on the breath. Remember, you can call me if you need to. While listening to these recordings, we slowly get closer to the aforementioned Homa Mart, where we will learn about the fate of Virginia Rule. Stepping inside the building, it is absolutely unknown to us and has a general unfriendly feel to it. The cold and dark nature of the Homa Mart fills us with unease as we make our way through our first puzzle, the automatic doors. They close as we get close to them, but in order to pass, we must simply turn our face away from them. Coming into the main section of the store, we hear the movements of something just out of our view, and coming up to the mirror, we encounter Virginia herself, now with the alias of the Watcher, who charges towards us screaming. We gain a new weapon specific to Virginia, which is just a broken shard of glass from the mirror, and we use this weapon to her disadvantage by using her own reflection against her, much like with the Medusa herself. And that is what we must continue to do for each and every single mirror that we find throughout the Homa Mark. As with each mirror that we break, she slowly gets closer and closer to breaking the mask that she bears. During these puzzles, we learn a bit more about her and her situation. The mannequins that surround the Homa Mart look scary, except they're actually there to help us. One even saves us from an encounter from the game's main antagonist by giving us the key to our freezer that we were locked inside of. Virginia viewed everyone around her as malicious no matter whether or not they were truly kind or not. And we see this with the mannequins. Throughout our time in Homa Mart, we can find a report which was made for Virginia which tells us the events that happened on the day that she died and what led up to it. On Wednesday afternoon, the Sheriff Department received a call from Mr. Anderson Parker, manager at Homamar Department Store, about a distraught woman screaming breaking various items in the store. Dispatch sent a call. Upon arrival at the scene, the suspect had already inflicted a stab wound to her abdomen and a fatal wound across her neck. Paramedics were called and police tape was used to seal off the crime scene for investigation. Suspect was identified as Miss Virginia Rule, who apparently had issues being seen in public or seeing her reflection. She was pronounced dead at the scene. Taking statements from co-workers and shoppers, it seems Miss Rule had a panic attack which resulted in the accidental breaking of a mirror. Due to the mishandling of the situation by people around her at the time, a quick escalation resulted in Miss Rule taking her own life using a shard of broken mirror glass. There is no evidence of foul play, though I suspect that she might have been in relations with a staff member named David. We'll go back for questioning. At the end of the segment, we find our final mirror and we spell out the word hated in some toy letter blocks. Sending Virginia into this final mirror causes her mask to break and we get a small talk with her, allowing her to now be at peace. It's okay. I see you. You can rest. 
us now. Virginia's character is sad from beginning to end and we see this continue with the other characters. Coming back outside of the home of Mart, we get another sequence of recordings. I think I'm ready now. We can talk about the scars. My face. If you'd like, yes. I appreciate you not asking me about them. I mean, I do see you looking at them. Everyone does all the time anyway. I'm listening. When I was a kid, my mom, she used to sign me up for like, Little Miss whatever the hell, you know, like these beauty pageants. For this one, I was practicing at home and I was in the bathroom just playing with like some of my mom's makeup and, and then I, sorry. Take your time. I just slipped. I don't know. I lost my balance and I grabbed the mirror cabinet and the whole thing just fell apart. I hate her. My mother. She made me go anyway. Made you go where? Out. To the pageant. To school. Everywhere. With a busted up face and stitches. A monster and a liar. She told me I was still pretty. She said people wouldn't judge me. Guess what? They did. They look at me with pity. I look back at them with hatred. <laughs> I hate her. I hate everyone. <laughs> I understand. Stop looking at me. Now back in Desmond's office, we are able to read her diagnosis. Patient began treatment as a mandated disciplinary measure in college. Roommates expressed concern, possible suicidal ideation. Patient would hide in her room for fear of judgment over her personal appearance. As a child, patient was entered into pageants by her mother, Gemma Rule, during which time she suffered verbal abuse relating to her appearance and performance. An accident took place in which a bathroom mirror had collapsed on a six-year-old Virginia, leaving her scarred, ending pageant participation. Patient suffers from the constant notion of judgement from others, stemming from pageant participation, compounded with an accident which resulted in facial disfigurement and an unsupportive home environment. Patient internalised this to an extreme degree, retaining a strong aversion to public spaces for fear of being judged. Patient won't look in mirrors, often lashing out in anger at those who she perceives as judging her. Patient was encouraged to establish routine errands that would put her outside. When the local grocery store shut down, thanks to a retail competition from the Home Mart Superstore, Patient had to alter her routine by picking up food in a much more crowded space. Heightened sense of anxiety as of late, increased sense of an unknown dread and fear. And finally, I just want to mention that there are vinyl tracks for each patient which all have their own songs and all are composed also by The Living Tombstone. And they are a really good representation of the characters and their stories and I just heavily suggest giving them a listen to if you like the game's soundtrack. As a whole, Virginia is a great way to get into the game, not just for mechanics but also to entail the details of the game and its symbolism and just the general storytelling through both its design and just items you can find in the world. Even down to the puzzles where in one we must get all of the eyes being shown on TV screens in the technology aisle to be facing a digital version of Virginia. It's all just perfectly placed to feel like everything was made for Virginia and her story in mind. And this continues throughout the entire game. I mean, coming back to just the automatic door puzzle, we have to turn away and hide our face from it much like Virginia would. Virginia has a very low opinion of herself and this is shown to us in every single aspect of Home of Art. And honestly, I'll say this about all the patients, there are so many little details in their sections that I won't even be able to mention in here, because even through playing the game I've probably missed a lot of them. I 
also want to know that at this point I took a small break from the game and when I came back I got probably the best tonal shift I've ever experienced in a game. This doesn't work. Hi. But moving on to Desmond's second patient, we make our way to the apartment of Alan Shaw, also named The Shade. And on the way, we begin to encounter these dark splodges that are just completely impassable to us as of right now. And next to one of them, we find a letter detailing that some of the lights have been going out and just aren't working. But making our way to Alan's apartment, we find it to be a bit more of a cabin than an apartment, with those dark splotches once again being present here too. Picking up Alan's tape, we find a note alongside it which informs us that Desmond had told Alan to start writing down his feelings when we learn that 1. Alan works and or lives at a lighthouse, and 2. He doesn't really like people all that much. And once again, like Virginia, we can find another Rorschach test. So basically, I just look at these pictures and say the first thing that pops into my head. Uh, basically, yeah. Okay, ready. <laughs> a trumpet player? A tall tree? A tower, maybe. Casting a long shadow? A small sailboat. Out to sea? It's raining? Hard? Maybe? Maybe it's caught in a storm? Whoa, trippy. I'm not sure what I'm looking at. It looks like a black hole, or... Or like a sinkhole? Yeah, that's it, a sinkhole. Endless at the bottom, you know? That one made me feel something, dog. It put a pit in my stomach. Does that mean it worked? The test? It's also very important to note that instead of having actual lights in this cabin, the entire house is lit up by candles and just general candle light. And that the themes of light and dark will be heavily present throughout all of Alan's tape. But once putting in Alan's tape into Desmond's office, we get a sequence of recordings. This time we are surrounded by ocean, abandoned boats, and whale carcasses. While also here, we can see that we're being watched by a lot of birds. Their eyes are red and unfriendly looking. Mr. Shore, tape's running. Thank you for agreeing to be recorded. Oh, um, should I just start talking? What do you want to know? Uh, what made you decide to seek counseling? Ah, oh, man, Doc, it's, it's just weird. As in, I feel weird, like, like I'm weird all the time, you know? I'm not saying this right. People think I'm weird, and it's cool I am, but I, I shouldn't feel weird, right? How exactly do you feel weird? Off, on, slightly tilted. I, I've had these nightmares ever since I can remember. I've always had these horrific dreams I can't explain. And they recur. Man, like there are themes in them that keep coming back. And uh, honestly, Doc, it's been such a constant that I shape my life around them, you know? Have you ever seen anyone about these recurring nightmares? Like a shriek, like you? No. Honestly, for the longest time, I thought it was normal life to wake up sweating, to see things in the dark, frightful things. What is it that frightens you? See, see, that's the thing I don't get. My my whole life, I could feel the presence of shadows. I could hear sorrow in the dark. It's poetic, man. I know. I I got so used to. Paralyzed by dread, uh, I began to like it. And people notice, you know, I, I, I say weird stuff sometimes, I guess. At some point, I just decided to live comfortably in this reality, maintaining a beacon of light over a sea of darkness, alone and afraid. But I'd be lying if I didn't admit that it being swallowed by darkness or, or sinking in the depths. It makes me feel alive, man. Electric. And one last thing to note about this area is that if we look up into the sky, we can see a bright bluish white star. And while Alan's associated color is yellow, his door is a bright bluish white. And seeing that Alan is severely afraid of the dark and shadows, it's just a really nice detail about him that his color would be the brightest star in the sky. Once again, it's just one of those little details about the game that you can even go by just without noticing at all. But after listening to these recordings, we find ourselves at Icarus Point, and it's from this point that we start to see those themes of Greek mythology coming back. The story of Icarus follows a boy with wings made of wax, and after flying too close to the sun, his wings melted, causing him to fall into the ocean and drown. 
and unlike with Virginia, this is made very prevalent to us by our antagonist. In Greek mythology, Icarus flies too close to the sun and it kills him. I'll spare you the analogy. In our story, you're going to bring the sun to Alan, and the both of you will burn. As he climbed higher and higher in the sky, do you think Icarus contemplated how weird a person he was? Why can't he just be normal? Do you think his parents pushed him to be a lawyer? To be a doctor? Like your parents did? But at the start of the level and throughout the entirety of it, we can find that we are constantly being watched and that something is off in the distance that we cannot see yet. But from the sounds of it, it is very destructive being able to take down entire trees with seemingly ease. And coming to the edge of the beach itself, we can find a hut with a blinding light coming out from it. Inside of which there is a light bulb for the ever so imposing lighthouse at the top of Icarus Point. And throughout the entire tape, it is shown that Alan had used the light as a comfort. However, for us, it'll be used as both a hindrance and a target to use against Alan. And the lighthouse is one of the examples of these very prominent figures, as if we are inside of its light, we will take damage. And for a majority of the level, we must balance our movement in accordance to the lighthouse. A lot like how Alan would have been working in the lighthouse itself. Lighthouses are used to make sure that boats don't crash into the shore, so if the light of the lighthouse were to go out, then it would mean, well, disaster could easily strike at any point. Another thing of note is that as we're walking up to the lighthouse, there is a massive car crash up the road, around which we can find this chemical that stepping inside of for too long causes us to start going loopy before taking damage. And this is important for many reasons, some of which I'll come back to later, but from the start of the game, this chemical has been around. However, it's only now that it has shown up for a second time in the tapes. This chemical was present around the apartment and even in Virginia's tape. And even before, back at the beach, we can see that it was starting to pollute the ocean near the shack from before. But like I said, we'll come back to this later, just make sure to keep the chemical and this specific car crash in mind for later. Near the top of Icarus Point, we can discover a plaque about the lighthouse, which starts to tick us in to what happened to Alan. Authorized to be constructed by President Harrison in 1889 and completed in 1891, at the cost of $22,300. When the lighthouse was completed, it stood some 300 feet from the edge of the cliff. The sandstone tower is 28 feet in diameter, of an octagonal shape and 80 feet to the lantern. Also, who cares? We're all gonna die sooner or later and these facts mean nothing. Are you even sure that you're really standing here reading this? Maybe this is some sort of horrific fever dream. Here's a random number, 300,000. Alan Shore was burned alive by the government. Throughout this tape, we learn more and more of what the kind of person Alan was. Alan had struggled with social awkwardness, we learn this from the tape and a couple of notes around the area. On top of this, Alan is described as being schizophrenic. He sees monsters in the dark and is fully convinced that they are real and trying to drag him into the darkness that they come from. Ever since he was a little kid, he had a severe phobia of the dark, and this had continued into adulthood. We learn more on this later after the tape is finished. When we see him now, however, as the shade, he is being completely dragged into the floor, which, as we'll see with all of the rest of the patients, the Rorschach test that we find in their apartment is exactly their design that we see them now. But right now, Alan's mind is in a panic and he's afraid of the light, which we use to our advantage against him. Much like with us in the lighthouse, the thing which once brought him comfort is being used against him. And after going through a couple of puzzles, most of them involving taking away parts of our own light which is causing us protection from Alan to access other areas, we finally make it to Alan's old house. His house is now burnt and abandoned and we must use the mirror shard that we got from Virginia's tape to find oil to put in lamps spread around the house in order to light it back up. And with each lamp, we slowly get more access to the house, where we find notes which shed even more light into what Alan was going through. More specifically, it tells us more about the night which Alan went into a coma. We learn that something happened to the lighthouse, something which plummeted the entire area into darkness and he was unable to see. Presumably the light had gone out. And through reading another note, we find that some kind of accident had happened because of this, and due to Alan being the watcher of the lighthouse when it happened, he blames himself for the incident. He believes that it was because of something that he did which caused the light to go out, and now that this has happened, he says that the monsters he was once told were fake are now coming out of the shadows, presumably to get him, and because of this, he picks up a flare gun with the intention of using it for his own protection. 
And with one final note, it says, By my light, the darkness will burn. I need to call Desmond. He would understand. And we'll come back to the rest of the phone call that he has with Desmond later, but it's starting to paint the picture that the fire, which put Alan in a coma, may have been from his own doing and not from any kind of malicious intent from the government. But oh, don't assume that just yet. Scattered around the tape, we find multiple letters, documents, notes, etc, all entailing orders of what to do because of the accident caused by the lighthouse malfunction. The boat which had crashed, the USS Thanatos, which bringing in the Greek mythology again, Thanatos was the personification of death and was recognised by Alan in one of his notes too. But this ship was carrying that same chemical that I was going on about earlier, and due to its crash, the government is trying their best to dispose all of it before anyone sees it. Starting off with just basic relocation, but eventually resorting to just blowing it all up due to its flammable nature. And after a while, we begin to piece together the story of what happened to Alan when we come across a newspaper article which reads, What really happened to Alan Shore? The case of Alan Shore, the lighthouse keeper suspected of setting the fire that consumed part of Icarus Point, continues to be a hot button issue. Alan's a pretty strange dude, but setting fire to his own house? I don't know if he's capable of doing something like that, said Frankie Nielsen, a frequent visitor to Icarus Point. An official press release by the Milton Haven Police Department asserts that Alan used a flare gun to start the fire, and that the case is currently being investigated as a failed suicide attempt. This reporter, however, had his doubts. Why would Alan have a flare gun in his possession, an item more commonly found on ships out of sea than at a lighthouse? The water gets muddled even further when considering Alan's call to the police shortly before the incident, which mentioned men in black going to and from the ship crash site at Patmos Beach. Did Alan see something he shouldn't have? Or is this just the product of a mentally unstable man's imagination? Only Alan Shore can answer these questions and he may never wake again. After running down to the ship crash to see what happened, Alan had witnessed the chemical and most likely due to being in close contact with it, began to feel its effects, and ran back to his house. The monsters he had seen were actually government agents and were described as men in black. It is unknown what could have happened to Alan if he actually did talk to the agent because like the paper said, we may never know that. However, unlike Virginia, Alan hadn't died for us to find us in this state, however the fire at the house merely put him in a comatose state. At the end of the segment, we walk up the stairs to the lighthouse and confront the thing that's been a hindrance to us ever since we got here. The lighthouse beacon itself. And it is not happy to see us, becoming far more damaging once we arrive. And after a quick fight, we put in a new bulb only to find that the power is out and we must travel back into the dark depths of the basement where we encounter Alan for the final time. Having to run as fast as we can, much like Alan probably would have to start up the generator whilst avoiding the darkness around us. And after being chased back up the stairs once again, we free Alan of his torment much like we do with Virginia. This time he begins to shine as bright as the beacon itself. It's okay, the ship, the fire, those weren't your fault. Whatever this chemical is, it's gotta be the source. You're braver than you know. Alan's madness came on just as suddenly as Virginia's did. I have no doubt their cases are linked. I need to follow the chemical trail, see where it takes me. Much like Virginia, throughout all of Alan's tapes, we were forced into the darkness with monsters chasing us, much like Alan would have his whole life. In each of these tapes, we are forced to go through what these patients are, but in our own kind of form of torment. Trying to find out what happened to the patients, why they all connect, and what is suddenly making them all being lost. Alan's tape is probably my favourite out of the four patients, just due to the absolutely amazing atmosphere and soundtrack that it has, and if not for that, the different forms of storytelling. There's quite a bit that I chose to skip, because if any of you wish to go and play the game yourself after watching this video, I heavily suggest doing so. Even outside of its story and symbolism, the game is just a great psychological survival horror game, and deserves way more attention than it's gotten. But coming back through the door, we get one final set of recordings with Alan's final phone call to Desmond. You've reached the office of Dr. Desmond Wales. Please leave a message after the tone. Doc? Doc, are you there? Why would you be there? It's the middle of a goddamn night! This is bad, man. I, I don't even know what's happening. I swear, Doc, I didn't even know it was supposed to come through. I'm 
pretty good at getting a copy of the log from the wharf. I know what's coming in. It's not even my job. I just like to be prepared. But that ship... It said nothing about that ship, man. And then the bulb, the bulb quit on me, man, when I needed it the most. It quit on me. Everything was so dark. And then, boom! The ground is shaking. I went down there. I, I wanted help. I wanted to make sure no one was hurt. But man, I don't know. There are monsters down there, Doc. I swear. I can see them in the shadows. They move around when I'm not looking. They try to grab me into the floor, Doc. I'm not... I, I, I'm losing it. I found one of those flare guns. Someone must have dropped it. Gotta fight darkness with light. <laughs> Could I not see it sooner? Gotta fight. Wait. They're here. They're here! The men in black! Oh, weird. That guy Nygaard is here. I've seen him around. Around you, man! I, I gotta warn them, Doc! They don't know about the monsters! Gotta fight the darkness with light, man. And after returning to the office, we can read Alan's patient file. The patient sought treatment on his own, complaining of a long-standing inability to be in the dark and of recurring nightmares in which shadows are moving and growing. He fears being touched or consumed by shadows. Born and raised in Montauk, New York, moved to New York City at 18 years of age, moved to Milton at 22. Patient had a persistent fear of the dark since early childhood, but nightmares may themselves be a manifestation of the phobia, strengthening it in the process. The obsessive need to keep the lights on was indulged by patient's parents, and it's likely that appeasement exuberated the issue. Patient's parents were both avid smokers, both died from lung cancer within a year of each other. Alan was 16 at the time, he likely spent the two years leading to his moving out alone. Patient has structured his life around a need for light at all times, including operating and maintaining Icarus Point Lighthouse, leaving a previous job as a mechanic for the Pandora Hotel. Patient feels strange around others, prefers a mostly solitary lifestyle. Patient lives adjacent to the lighthouse. Patient sometimes expresses excitement involving his phobia, enjoying the thrill of the ride when scared, possible masochistic tendencies. Additional, admitted to NLH after suffering near-fatal burns the night of a ship crash. Condition, comatose. Alan's character is one that, much like Virginia, is strange from the moment we meet him. But after learning what he's going through, we see the unfortunate situation that we find him in which had absolutely no fault of his. From what we can find from notes around the lighthouse, it had always been faulty and the light going out was something that was just out of Alan's control. However, due to his schizophrenic nature, he began to believe that what happened was truly his fault, and he believed that the men in black were monsters. Throughout our time with him, we see Alan in this constant state of just fear and confusion. However, in the end, he did always describe it as being a bit of a thrill to him, so... Throughout everything, at least he seems to have that. Max Nygaard, also known as the Bull, is our third patient that we meet. Using our newly acquired flare gun, we are able to gain access to the previously blocked off apartment. Inside, we can find it to be pretty much empty apart from some broken furniture, boxes, and a garage containing Max's truck. In the area, we can also find a child's photo of a family, presumably belonging to Max. However, it doesn't take long to see how this story ends, with multiple documents around the house informing us of a recent termination from a transport driver job, a loss of custody over his daughter to his ex-wife, and just overall things aren't looking so good for Max. We can find a letter in the garage of Max's friend who questions him about the time he punched a hole in a wall and says that he'd be happy to fix it up for him. Which we can also see on a little note if we look at the wall it is actually patched up, which is just a little nice attention to detail. On top of this we can also find another Rorschach test. What does this tell you? What I dream about and such? Not exactly, it clues me into the way you think mostly. Fine, lay it on me. What might this be? The... Uh, nothing? No, really, I see nothing that makes sense. Try. That... A baby? A crying baby? Next. An animal, some kind of beast? Alright. A ball. That's what it is. Big old ball, coming to get you. And it doesn't take a genius to see that Max struggles with anger issues, with most of the items in the house either being broken or just generally in a state of disrepair, it's clear to see that Max is a very violent man, and this is confirmed to us when we hear the recordings at the beginning of the tape. Why do you even want to record this? 
what's in it for you, blackmail? Never. Mr. Nygaard, if you're not comfortable being recorded, I'll, I'll turn it right off. No, I got nothing to hide. We're here for the truth, right? Court-ordered truth, right? Yes. The court did mandate these sessions, but this is a place where we'll work on healing. And generally speaking, the truth is good for that. Well, I ain't no liar. Not like Alice says. Alice is your ex-wife. Wife. She's my wife! I didn't sign no paper that says otherwise. Everybody's trying to upend my life here. Trying to ruin my marriage. Take my kid away and turn her against me. Next is what? You want to take away my rights? My freedom? Tell you what, why don't you give me them pills you're probably paid to give out, and I'll pretend like I take them so I can go home. I'm a therapist, Max, not a psychiatrist. I don't prescribe medication. I am here to help. We can work our way around to talking about Alice later. Tell me, how do you feel about your work at the quarry? Quarry's dead. Meyer bought up all that land. I drive for them now. Not that it makes any difference, driving is driving. Gotta help them deliver some big shipment one of these nights and they're being all secretive about it. But I don't care what the job is, I'll do it. Use the money to pay for my little girl's college, cause guess what? I am a good father, despite what they say. This time we enter on a railway in the middle of the country, and unlike the two that came before, the environment gives off a more intimidating nature rather than one of unknown fear. The industrial style of the factory and its big machinery give off this foreboding sense of emptiness. However, the distant cries tell us otherwise. After arriving at the factory and completing a few puzzles, we are informed of a friend waiting for us at the end of the train tracks, and oh boy, let me just play it for you. Max comes to us in the form of a mechanical bullhead, very similar to that on the front of his truck. And once again, it's pretty obvious to tell that his inspiration is that of the Greek mythology creature, the Minotaur, a half-man, half-bull creature. Max will wander around until spotting the player, at which he will make a charge at them. And for a majority of the level, the puzzles aren't really all that targeted at him, more they are targeted towards the game's main plot point, Agent Rainbow. But we'll get back to that later. Max will come back to chase us for multiple parts of the level, but it all comes to a head at the end where Max comes back to chase us for the final time. After we manufacture some lure pills, we take Max down into the quarry, where we must first calm him down before he attempts to pull his truck out of the quarry, which he is unable to do before falling apart. won't be in vain. Thank you for leading me here. But you may be asking how that truck even got down there in the first place. Well, do you remember that car crash I told you about before? Max is the cause of that crash. At the time of his employment, Max worked as a truck driver for Meyer Pharmaceuticals until one day he causes an accident, which in turn causes a bunch of Agent Rainbow chemicals to release onto the road, so they fire him. He believes that after 20 years of flawless driving that he is unfairly fired, and decides during a meeting with Desmond that he's gonna go back there and force them to hire him back. In the process, he rams his way into the factory with his truck, acts aggressively to the other workers and just generally causes up a big stir, which eventually leads to his death after he presumably drives his truck into the quarry and drowning, 
However, it's never really confirmed how he truly dies. It's just kind of an assumption because, you know, that's where we find the truck in the end. No, there wasn't any violence in my upbringing. There was discipline and yeah, sometimes it hurt, but get that dumbass cat out of here. I'm gonna toss it out the window. Damn thing makes my nose itch. Tanya, out. Let's not threaten the cat. I'll keep her outside. I didn't mean that. I'm sorry. I just... Look, I'm willing to admit that I... I get angry sometimes, but... There's a lot of stuff that's pissing me off, Doc. Like what? I lost my job. I, I don't even really know why, or... Those Meyer bastards! So I had a small accident with that shipment of pharmaceutical juice or whatever. So what? Don't I get any credit for 20 years of flawless driving? Man, whatever that shit was made me feel sick to my stomach. Damn stuff's probably toxic too. Seeing as I can't even recall it fully and it was only two nights ago. That must be very frustrating. How often would you say you feel... God damn it! You know what? How am I supposed to show the court I've got my life together if I ain't got no job for no real reason? I have a good mind to go back to the quarry and have a nice long chat with those Meyer folk. Maybe I'll take that army hippie guy with me. He said he'll give me 200 bucks if I can get him into the quarry. Perhaps we should discuss your approach in a calm... No! In fact, if they don't hire me back right away, there'll be hell to pay. I'm going. You're required to stay for the full session, Mr. Nygaard. Oh yeah? Try and stop me. And of course, once again coming back to the office, we are able to read about Max's patient file. Court ordered treatment after domestic disturbance at home, to which the police were called. Patient's wife did not press charges, but the state required a police report and legal action regardless. Patient's wife and children have since moved out. Patient deflects the issue, but his father is incarcerated over violence towards his mother. Patient appears to carry resentment counterintuitively, for his mother, who it appears had an affair when he was young and then married the man. Stepfather was likely also abusive, but Patient refuses to engage on the topic. Patient has a 10-year-old daughter named Madison and a wife named Alice, who is seemingly no longer living at home and may have filed for separation. Patient insists on referring to her in the present tense, not as ex, and will not acknowledge their separation, as though he is certain that it is temporary. Patient recently lost his job as a driver for Meyer Pharmaceuticals after an apparent accident hauling sensitive cargo. Max displays intense jealousy and anger when he feels he is disrespected or his control is threatened. He's been given basic exercises, deep breaths, counting, etc., but it's hard to discern what it is or is not working. Narcissistic tendencies cause the patient to change the subject. When confronted, Max gets angry and redirects blame. Instances of projection of resentment towards his wife, Patient believes it is her fault that he is here, not the domestic violence incident. Additional, Max stormed off before completing his last session, has not returned in two weeks. State court notified. Now I will be completely honest when I say that out of all of the patients, Max was the one who scared me the most of his tape. While it may not be the darkest environment, it still managed to give me that sense of dread horror is so good at. And even after meeting Max, I was genuinely scared of going in between buildings and areas because I was so scared that he could just appear at any moment by bursting through a wall. This level also introduces another final enemy, which I haven't really talked about them yet, but the game's main enemies are the ink blots, which obviously represent things like the Rorschach test. In Max's tape, we get introduced to the ink block brew, a massive enemy which at first made me panic more than any other enemy in the game because I just didn't know what to do. And overall, it just kind of seems like that was Max's whole vibe whilst I was playing. He's this big narcissistic brute and that really shines through in his design. In the end, he's just a boy with a horrible upbringing that made him think that this kind of behavior was normal and ran with it. Even down to the design of him being a bull. Bulls are known to be aggressive and angry and that is exactly what Max is. And while I don't really have much to talk about Max, because out of all of the patients, he's also the one that gets a, like, a lot of the less of the spotlight in his tape, I feel like for a lot of Max's tape, it focuses more on Agent Rainbow and all of the like things that were going on behind the scenes with the government and Meyer Pharmaceuticals. So, 
It's a bit of a letdown with Max, but nonetheless, he is still has incredible symbolism in his design, and I still appreciate him a lot. After coming out of Max's tape, Tanya, which, oh yeah, by the way, we have a talking cat, I'll talk more about her later on, but she lets us know that someone's left a message for us on the phone whilst we were away. This turns out to be none other than Lucas Cole, also titled as The Flash. We immediately make our way to his apartment, and after a brief intermission due to an intervention with our antagonist, we find out that much like Alan, Lucas' apartment is more of a cabin, and after taking a look around, we find evidence of Lucas, at least at some point, was in the army and makes it very clear with his choice of decor and lifestyle. Whatever is going on with him, he is very invested in what Meyer Pharmaceuticals is up to and what their involvement with the government is. Around his cabin, we find notes which detail possibly how he was involved in the army, with even one note stating, The life expectancy of a radio man was five seconds. Always defy the odds. This, combined with the fact that there is copious amounts of radio equipment, makes it very clear to see that at some point in time, Lucas had served as a radio man in the army, and of course we get another Rorschach test. Rorschach test, huh? Familiar? Sure, don't be surprised if I see something freaky. Alright then. Looks like a house and a lake. Alright. Some sort of mushroom cloud? Oh, um, uh, it looks like a... Hey, can I get a drink of water? I'm not feeling too hot all of a sudden. And once we get into his tape, we are surrounded by dense trees, and we must follow the light of flares to make our way to the next recording. Nice place you got here. Cozy. And this table? Is it mahogany or oak? I actually have no idea. <laughs> um, Alright, Mr. Cole. Why don't you sit down so we can start with the basics? Have you ever had therapy or counseling before? Straight to the point, huh, Doc? Sorry, I... You're not the first therapist I've met with, but I, I sometimes find it difficult to open up. Past therapy sessions were very... productive. I'm sorry to hear that. I'm not a super social guy, so you're the first person I've spoken more than a sentence with since I moved here. About a month ago? In that case, welcome to Milton Haven. <laughs> Thanks. Well, since I'm on the road so much, I, I tend to keep to myself, but... Sometimes I feel like paying people to talk to me. <laughs> I just got a little cabin just outside of uh, town. It's a nice upgrade from living in a van crammed with gear. So, what brings you here? That's a good question. I need help staying... sane. You see, how this usually goes is that I tell you, the therapist, a story from my time in the armed forces of horrifying experiments, government conspiracies, and cover-ups. Then at some point, you're gonna give me the look. The look? The look you're giving me right now. The look that says I'm talking to a lunatic. Lunatic? No. Uh, but I am a bit puzzled. Uh, I would very much like to hear your story. All right, I'll tell it to you, but well, I've been made to doubt myself for years, so... I hope you'll take it seriously, take me seriously, and don't give me that look, neither. Just let me do the talking for a bit, okay? Lucas suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder due to his time in the army. And during these tapes, we learned that from previous therapists, he felt disregarded or pushed aside, due to the things that he had seen during his time. Those he tells these stories to don't believe them, and it's caused him to become dead set on finding the truth. During his time in the army, he had been tested on using the Agent Rainbow chemical, and because of this, he's now prone to moments of PTSD episodes, one of which resulting in the death of his friend. After being discharged from the army due to asking too many questions, he'd started to relentlessly track down anything he can about the chemical. In Lucas's tape, we find ourselves in Elysium State Park, Lucas's current place of residence and employment. Off in the distance, we can hear the sounds of something big, and it doesn't take long to see what it is. Bringing our Greek mythology all together, we can find Lucas in the form of Cyclops, a large creature bearing only one giant eye. 
To be more specific, he takes on the form of a giant mix of a radio tower and a sniper, due to both of those being his prominent roles in the army. And now, due to his PTSD, even though he may be back home, the war has also followed him there. And we see this when we start running around in the forest, we begin to have these episodes much like Lucas would have. At random points of the tape, the sky will turn red as warfare begins to surround us. And after finding a radio remote inside of Lucas's cabin, this becomes our main form of puzzle throughout the tape. With the main goal of entering this sealed off bunker, one which Lucas has been trying to get inside of for some time. And much like with Max's tape, we learn a lot of stuff about the Agent Rainbow Chemical and what's really been going on behind the scenes. But as I've said before, we'll get to that soon enough. Lucas is an absolutely massive figure in the woods and will encounter us at random points while we make our way to each of four towers to unveil the code to get into the bunker. However, after getting into the bunker, we make our way up to this massive signal dish and do what we came here for, to reach out to Lucas. And after a quick battle with him, we're able to do so. It's okay. Lucas knew there was more to this than meets the eye. I need to make contact with him. Lucas is the only one of Desmond's patients that is still alive, and isn't either dead or in a comatose state. Whilst in this tape, we learn that with Agent Rainbow, it connects everyone who is affected by it through radio waves, and so we use this to reach out to Lucas in the real world. And as we see at the end of the game, Lucas does eventually come and save us. Desmond, Desmond, can you hear me? Are you in there? Damn it. Desmond, you're breathing. Yes. I heard you, man. I heard you in the back of my mind. My goodness, what did you do to this place? Judging by the package on the table, I guess they got to you before I did. Bastards. You'll be all right, my friend. Rest. And when you feel better, we'll take the fight to them. However, going back through the door, we get another set of recordings. So that's me in a nutshell, the kooky government conspiracy man. So what's the verdict, Doc? Added room or no? Uh, I have to admit, this is a lot to take in. Figured you'd say as much. Oh, I, I believe your conviction is genuine. I'd like to talk more about it during our next session. Wow, that's... Thanks. Hey, uh, you know, I... I conducted a little security check on your building today. It's pretty lax. Practically anyone could waltz in here and stash all sorts of ill-gotten goods. Drugs, weaponry, dinosaur bones. Doc? You all right, Doc? You're not all there today, are you? Been staring out the window a lot. Uh, yes, 
I apologize. It's about that cat of yours, Tanya, right? I'm sorry. Uh, Lucas, is everything all right? Yeah. Sorry, I just... I thought I heard something. You didn't hear that, a, a woman's voice? No. Interesting. Well, uh, I was saying... Sorry for your loss. She was very... edible. I saw you bury her by the old church. I wasn't gonna say nothing, but... What got her? Curiosity? Yes. That and... And then, of course, we get another patient file. Patient sought treatment on his own upon relocation to Milton Haven. Previous attempts at therapy has been mentioned as unsuccessful, unsatisfactory. Lucas mentions that he's felt ignored and dismissed by previous therapists, as well as army officials and the Veterans Association. Born and raised in Northern Florida, patient had excellent test scores throughout school and was determined to be the first member of his family to go to college. However, patient enlisted in the army following the steps of his father, Dwayne Cole where he showed an affinity for electronics. Lucas spent 14 months fighting overseas before returning home. Patient suffers from a clear case of PTSD relating to combat, loss of friends. Patient claims to have been drugged during the war, an accusation he said would not be believed or taken seriously by anyone during or after his service. Patient came back stateside and has been obsessively looking for answers, a quest that has led him here. Lucas claims he has secured a job as a groundskeeper at Elysium State Park, and he was authorized to reside in a small cabin if he fixed it up, which he did. Patient is thoughtful and open when speaking about most topics. When the subject of war comes up, Patient seems to show some symptoms of psychosis. He speaks of monsters. But he speaks very clearly and convincingly. Further consultation is advised before reaching a final diagnosis. Patient has a clear post-traumatic adrenal response to memories of combat. Vivid memory, vivid imagination. Patient's father passed away 10 years ago. Lucas oddly deflects any and all questions about his mother. Lucas's character is one that in a horror perspective is this massive foreboding figure, but in a design perspective is one that much like the rest of Desmond's patients is full of sorrow, and his physical design definitely characterizes this. He's seen absolutely horrendous things and now nobody will believe what he says, even though what he says is 100% the truth. And even though he is a lot like Max in the way of as the tapes go on, the subject of Agent Rainbow begins to take the spotlight, we're told enough about Lucas with the time that we have with him, but it still feels like his character is fleshed out just as much as the others. Lucas wants to find the truth of what happened to him and it's become his entire life. Even now, when we see him in the tape, the war is still with him, and that is very prevalent with his design. Even just the way he talks, he doesn't talk like a normal person would, he speaks in commands and things that you'd normally say at war. He still believes that he's at war and he must continue fighting to find out what happened to him, because nobody will believe him. Not unless he finds evidence of the truth. And that is exactly what we find in that bunker. So for this final part, it contains serious spoilers for the end of the game. If you want to go and experience the story for yourself, I heavily suggest doing so now. While playing this game, it has quickly jumped way up to being in my top 5 of all time, and experiencing it for the first time was just an absolute treat. There's still a lot that I haven't talked about in this video and I don't talk about in this video, so there's still a lot of the game left for you to explore yourself, but without further delay, Let's talk about our last three characters. Finishing with the patients, I want to move on to talking about Desmond himself. At certain parts of each patient's tapes, we learn little things about Desmond. However, all the way at the start of the game, we get our own tape about Desmond himself. Walking into Desmond's apartment, we can immediately find a letter from none other than Meyer Pharmaceuticals, which talks about thanking Desmond for him and his continued support of the company. But apart from that, Desmond's apartment is pretty plain for right now. The only thing of concern is his locked bedroom door, but we'll be coming back to that soon. Walking into Desmond's office, we get the first of many phone calls. There he is. Long have I waited for 
for this moment, to watch as you scramble for your last breath, as you try to make sense of your reality and the gravity it carries, pulling you down. <laughs> Ooh, I can't contain my excitement! <laughs> I will have you, Desmond Wales. I will have all of you. That is none other than our game's main protagonist, Agent Rainbow himself. Agent Rainbow follows through the entire game and is responsible for scaring the shit out of me at many a times. This is due to him having a chance to just show up behind you at any point in time. But ignoring him and putting in the tape, we get these recordings. In an unexpected turn of events, it seems I'm the one who's losing my mind. Why or how this is all happening is beyond me. But as strange as this is, I'm equally as fascinated as I am scared. Life in Milton Haven has become unfamiliar lately. Or, well, I'm starting to see unusual patterns, behaviors. Ever since the crash, maybe. It's beginning to make sense, I suppose. My own feelings of dread, of fear, are similar to those of my patients. My patients were dropping like flies, dying. Oh, poor Virginia. I should go over their cases. I need to understand what this is. If I can get through this, if I can just keep my mind focused, I must stay aware, awake, alert. From these tapes, we learned that Desmond is losing his patience, but obviously at this point, we already knew that. He wants to find out why and what's been happening to them for them all to suddenly change their behaviours. He knows something is wrong and even references the boat crash down at Icarus Point. Which, like when we realised everything was so close together, it's not that hard to see why this could have an effect. If we look up at one of the lampposts whilst we are exploring this tape, we can see a yellowed eyed figure of a cat. This means nothing to us right now, but will do very soon. However, from this point on we are constantly tormented by Agent Rainbow. He wants us dead and will do anything to get at us. He even sabotages the elevator and tries more direct approaches at killing us towards the end of the game. All coming to one point as we find our final tape. Asian Rainbow's tape. After completing Lucas's tape, we receive one final call from Agent Rainbow, informing us that he's left us a gift in the main hall. Making our way over, a shipping crate crashes through the front door. It contains the tape. Putting in the tape in our office, we get a small musical number, which I want to point out. This, this fucking song's been in my head ever since I started making this video and I don't think it's leaving anytime soon. But after we get our small little musical number, Agent Rainbow turns to us and waits for us to confront him for the first time in the whole game. Now we get to hear some tapes from the man himself. Long have I waited for this moment. Spotlight, this stage, a stage made of mistakes, misfortune, and regret. There won't be an encore, only sweet, eternal death. But before that, congratulations are in order. Way to go, Desmond. You made it. You failed all the way to the top. You were right, you know. Your patients weren't bad people, but they were. Virginia could not overcome her watcher, nor could Alan his shade. Max lost heart to his bull, Lucas gone in a flash, and you, you succumb to me. So why have I been sneaking around, causing chaos? What's my motive? Who do I work for? Well, I'm not some government agent. I'm your Agent Rainbow. I'm everything you don't want to be. Your fears, your guilt, your paranoia, giving form, and the plan to run you ragged, chip away at your 
Here we learn that the whole time Agent Rainbow has been all but a mirrored version of ourselves. And if we don't beat him now, he is what we are going to become. Everything that we don't want to be is what we might be if we fail at this point. Agent Rainbow doesn't represent the chemical that's been affecting everyone, but rather he is what the effects on us will be. Agent Rainbow as a chemical was used to control people's minds through fear and radio waves, and from that clear letter at the start of the game, we see that Desmond has been affected for a very long time. More on that later. In this final area, gravity doesn't work like it should and nothing here looks like anything we have seen before. However, making our way onto a giant cassette tape, we begin to collect the tapes of those who we have seen throughout the game, all while being yelled at by Agent Rainbow himself. After this, the rest of the tape consists of jumping from tape to tape as they crash towards us, and confronting Agent Rainbow on how our patients improve during our time with them, and how we should follow in their footsteps. What do you think you're doing? Virginia made an effort to change her narrative. I'm taking her lead. Get out of here! The frenetic puzzle Those tanks mean nothing! You- Alan had the courage to face his fears. It's time I do the same. You stubborn beast! Even with a tough case like Max, Progress was made. Change is possible. What are you doing? Stay away from that! You are weak! Well, if Lucas taught me anything, it's that sometimes the voices in your head, they're wrong. You can't just record over me! I'm afraid our time is up. The next time you want to talk to me, Make an appointment. And I haven't really talked about it much yet, but the soundtracks for each of these segments for everyone's tapes are just absolutely stunning. For each tape we've been through so far, they've all had absolutely immaculate soundtracks to go along with whatever is after us, and just matches the characters so well. Especially in this final segment with Agent Rainbow, everything just sounds so climactic that you know that this is the final part of the game just from listening to the soundtrack alone. I mean, even just looking at the actual song itself, Here Comes a Savior, this game is so well, it's like, it's so well put into this song and I love it so much and it is leitmotif throughout the entire game. Agent Rainbow has now been pushed away, and in one final move of defiance from him, we take his hat as we walk through the door. For our final set of tapes, walking back through that oh-so-familiar dock from the start of the game. In an unexpected turn of events, it seems that I'm coming out the other side. Why and how this is all happening is becoming clear, and as strange as this is, I am equally as fascinated as I am mad. Life for me will never be the same. I'm grateful to survive, but at what cost? I'm yet to know. While I can see the fog clearing, I can also feel my skull. My brain is, is pulsing. Something is different. Why and the government think they have autonomous control over us, that they can shove us around and we'll take it. They fail to realize that by pushing a bird out of its nest, you teach it to fly. I'm going on record. Meyer's gonna pay for what they've done. To Virginia, to Alan, to Max, Lucas, Rosemary, to Milton, to everyone. I am right. I am just. 
I am alive, and I am in sound mind. Come and tell me otherwise. Now here's where things get interesting with Desmond. Not like it already was, but you know it gets even more interesting. After coming out of our final tape, we get a talk with Tanya, who gives us the key to our locked bedroom door, saying that we're finally ready to confront what's in there now and that we should meet her on the roof whenever we're ready to end the game. And I haven't really talked about Tanya, but when we meet her for the first time, Desmond just seems to be happy that she's alive. And that is because Tanya in this dream world, which for those who are still confused about the whole dream world thing, the reason that Desmond is in this dream world in the first place is because due to his affiliation with all of his patients and their instances with the Agent Rainbow chemical, the government just decided to come to Desmond and just poison him with a shit ton of it and that's where we are now. And it's also why Lucas comes to save us at the end of the game. He finds us and he says, oh you're still breathing, which he, he just he saves us from being poisoned. And having that whole fight with Agent Rainbow and why he wanted us dead so badly is because of just being the chemical itself trying to kill us and us fighting against him in this dream reality is the only reason that we're still alive. But coming back to Tanya, in the real world she is Desmond's dead cat, who died after he was broken up with by his girlfriend due to, in a sick twist of fate, in helping others he became unable to help himself and his own emotions, making him completely unemotionally available and getting sucked into other people's problems. And because of this, Desmond made the mistake of buying a lily plant, one which is poisonous to cats, and in the end, caused the death of Tanya, who was at the time his only companion. So at the start of the game, when Agent Rainbow says that Curiosity killed the cat, and that he killed the cat, that is because Agent Rainbow is Desmond. Desmond killed Tanya due to his own mistake. They say Curiosity killed the cat. <laughs> I killed the cat. Curiosity only brought her to me. But because of this, Desmond began to become his own therapist, giving himself his own analysis. We can find this in the now unlocked bedroom. Patient is following the good psychological practice of self-analysis. Patient considered finding a third-party professional, but ultimately decided that this could result in unwanted prying into a past best left alone. Following the death and disappearance of several people under his care, Patient has come to seriously question his methods, and whether or not he is also at risk. Patient has difficulty reconciling with the fact that no matter how much he works on himself, it won't bring Magdalena back. Which, by the way, Magdalena is the name of Desmond's ex-girlfriend. Born and raised in Milton Haven, the only child of Jack and Melinda Wales, undergraduate degree in neurology and semiotics from Pacific State College. Graduated with honors medical school at Virgil Med Residency at Orkian Falls Medical Center. Likes long walks on the beach and being bad at video games. Patient has doubts about the methodology of his treatment. Is he providing his patients with the best possible professional advice? Or is he consciously or subconsciously driving them to self-destruction? Patient's mind is confused for worry for his own safety. What if what happened to them will happen to me? Is danger lurking at every corner? Magdalena once told me that I am incapable of taking care of my own issues since I'm always knee deep in other people's problems. Assuming she's correct, how do I change that about myself? Should I? Also in this room, we can find an apology note from Desmond to Tanya. My dearest Tanya, my heart is heavy with grief. The void you'd left behind is unexpected. Words alone cannot describe how sorry I am for my actions. My ignorance to the toxic relationship between the cat and the lily flower has left me a smarter man who feels like a fool. I sit in my office, slipping into memories of you knocking shit off my table and looking to me for affirmation. Thoughts of you sitting beside me, curiously listening to the troubles of others and helping them by accepting their flaws and letting them pet you, are and forever will be priceless memories. Thank you, my dear friend, for countless days of playful calm, for reciprocated love, and for choosing me. Desmond. We can obviously see that Desmond is absolutely devastated by the death of Tanya and is trying his best to learn from it. 
Tanya was all he had and now he has no one, and he really doesn't want that to happen again. Tanya is a character that helps us throughout the entire game, suggesting us on what to do next, letting us know when things change in the world, and towards the game, even saves us from Agent Rainbow's attempt to kill us. And this also gives the game the title of being able to make me absolutely cry my eyes out whilst also having a fart joke in it. I could really go for a cheeseburger right about now. Uh, oops. I mean, Desmond, behave! This is my gas mask. Ugh, sheesh. But making our way up to the roof, we get this final scene where Desmond finally confronts his mistakes with Tanya. I wish this ending could have been a happier one. But... But life doesn't work that way. Getting rid of me will be the challenge of a lifetime. You may have won the battle, but you've only saved yourself. Agent Rainbow is still out there, and you are powerless to stop them what's coming. Don't listen to him. He's afraid because he knows exactly what you're capable of. What am I capable of? Time will tell. Patience and grace. So... This is goodbye? You said goodbye before. I wouldn't lose any sleep on it. I'm sorry. It was my fault. I should have known. You did your best. You loved me, and that's all I ever cared about. Besides, I live on. In your head, so that's something. <laughs> Thank you, Tanya. For everything. You're a real cool cat. Yeah. I know. The ending of In Sound Mind definitely would not have hit the same way with me if the characters in the game weren't so well made and symbolized. Even just talking about their physical designs alone, each and every single one of them has this absolutely amazing touch to them that just really matches what they're going through and what their story is. Even down to Tanya at the end of the game. It is possibly theorized that the voice of Tanya could be that of Desmond's ex-girlfriend. And I feel like the game could have completely have wiped out the fact of Tanya and just had it be all about the four patients and Agent Rainbow, but it definitely would not have hit the same. Tanya and Agent Rainbow are both incredible characters that are insanely important to Desmond's development throughout the game. If it wasn't for them, then I wouldn't even be making a segment about Desmond because there'd be nothing to him. Both Tanya and Agent Rainbow represent two sides of a coin. Agent Rainbow wants to drag Desmond down, make him like him, and just be this absolute shithead and everything that he doesn't want to be. Meanwhile, Tanya wants to help him. Tanya wants him to get better and learn from his mistakes, and we see this heavily throughout the characters both in design and just the way they act towards Desmond. And I mention all of this just to say that with absolute certainty that this game has become one of my top five of all time. If not just from what I've talked about in this video, but just in the vibe of the game. I mean, look at this. The game's visuals are absolutely stunning, and to accompany all of it, we have those amazing soundtracks you heard me mention before. The gameplay is absolutely phenomenal, and the puzzles make it even better. This game is one of the best, and I definitely think it deserves a lot more attention than what it's gotten. And like I've said before, I've only talked about a small portion of the game. I mean, just focusing in on characters and their designs alone, chose to skip out an entire other character named Rosemary. She is incredibly, like, a massive chunk of the lore and I just heavily suggest you go and play the game because she's best to just experience for yourself. Whether you buy the game yourself or just watch someone play it, which by the way I may or may not be planning on streaming it over on my Twitch, twitch.tv slash 1amwolfram after I finish with inscription, but in either way that you experience it, just go and watch it, go show some love to everyone involved in the game, because I can assure you that you will not be disappointed with this game. But that will be all for today. I sincerely hope that you've enjoyed this video as much as I have had making it, and make sure to subscribe to not miss the next upload. And I'll be seeing you next week. Bye bye